see, and then we can talk about focus after that. We live, Vlad? <laughs> we are live and ready to go, Dave. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, everyone, uh, welcome to, uh, to Manufacturing Hub. We're, we're going to jump into it. Um, as Rob so kindly pointed out, I do sound like I'm coming from a, a landline from 1984. I'm actually coming to everyone uh, in the Canadian Rockies in uh, the tiny town of Jasper in Jasper National Park, uh, looking at seeing a whole bunch of snow-covered mountains. So if the audio isn't quite as crisp as normal, uh, please bear with me. Uh, I will post text later this week of, of many of the things that we've seen and maybe the glacier that we got to climb on. Um, as we jump into uh, to June, we, we have a very exciting new theme. So we're doing the industrial internet of things, the internet of things, and uh, generally a very much an introductory to the uh, the internet of things. As, as you guys will be able to tell us Rob very soon, we could talk about IoT for, I don't know, 50 or 60 or 200 hours and still just barely scrape the surface. So we're very excited uh, to get into this. And with that, we want to make sure to thank uh, Phoenix Contact for sponsoring this theme and their, their continued support of the community in general. Um, I will tease out that we will have Ira Sharp coming on uh, next week on the 15th uh, to help us dive deeper. Uh, and it's only taken us like 60 episodes of asking Ira if he can come onto the show in order to actually get him onto the show. Um, there is a ton of events going on. So both um, Automate is going on in Detroit this week, as well as I think ARC Forum or ARC Forum is going on, assumably in Orlando. Uh, they're rescheduled this week. So if you guys are at an event, uh, please drop the event that you're at and your favorite booth and what everyone should uh, should check out. Vlad was having some uh, some FOMO and uh, some longing of, man, I really wish I had <laughs> gone to, uh, to these events. Uh, speaking of Vlad, I get to embarrass Vlad. Uh, so everyone may or may not know that Vlad runs Solus PLC, a successful training site and YouTube channel. We can wave hi to Solus because they are currently uh, – listening in they crested more than 30,000 subscribers on the way to 30 31,000 subscribers and seeing as Vlad will not ask people to subscribe this is my request to ask people to subscribe to I suppose not only Solus PLC but please also subscribe to Manufacturing Hub there are a ton of new people in here so if you guys like this show head on over to manufacturinghub.live we have 63 other episodes that are up you guys can see the videos you guys can hear the audio and if you would like to sign up uh, for email notifications that come out generally once a week uh, warning you of these live events please feel free to uh, to do that as well to stay up on everything uh, with that glad any other thoughts before we jump in I was going to just add one more point, Dave, and I take your criticism and I would like to ask those of you who are listening because we do uh, pay attention to this, but there's people sharing the episodes. If you find value in any of the clips, if you find value in our live or in the um, audio podcast forum, make sure to share with those that you know in manufacturing. And we are also looking for guests. I've asked this about in a post. So if you have interesting guests that you want to come talk to me and Dave and uh, join us on the Manufacturing Hub, make sure to send me or Dave a note. But uh, without further delay, oh. go ahead, Dave. I love that. We'll get a little bit more self-promotion in. It's, again, only 64 episodes, and Vlad is finally asking for things. Uh, so congratulations, Rob. Uh, you are on a landmark event. Uh, but no, with that... Everyone, welcome to Manufacturing Hub with me, Dave, and this guy up here, Vlad. We are talking about the industrial Internet of Things, the Internet of Things, the introduction to the Internet of Things, all things Internet of Things. And this is episode 64 with our very special guest, uh, Rob Tiffany. Rob, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great stuff. You know, thanks, thanks for joining us today, Rob. Before we dive into the technology side of things, could you give us maybe more of your background? How did you get started? How what was your path in manufacturing technology? What did you do and where are you today? Wow, that's a mouthful. All right. Well, 30 minutes from now, I'll be done. Um, so back in the early 90s, Al Gore and I invented the Internet of Things. Um, you know, dinosaurs were still roaming the earth and stuff like that at that time. So, you know, when we went from uh, ARPANET, DARPA, to letting the rest of the world have the Internet, you know, 
All right. So I used to way back when drive submarines. I was in the Navy and I was on a SEAL team submarine and I was on a Trident submarine with all the ICBMs. And that was like the first place I started seeing things like sensors uh, to help keep us alive, you know, and uh, you, you, a lot of times they're just around you. You don't even think about it, you know, and it's a lot of the same sensors you probably see in factories and other places. But when you're in a tube underwater, you know, you're monitoring pressure, all kinds of gas sensors, radiation. Of course, we would do drills because we do have a reactor in there and a bunch of other things that could blow up. Um, and so I was like, what's this all about? And, uh, and of course, the probably the most famous sensor on a submarine would be sonar, right? You know, one ping only, right? So when I got out of the Navy, I had to get a job like a real guy. And I joined a startup, you know, um, I think that's, you know, like you kind of go a fork in the road and you're like, am I just going to be a big corporate guy or am I going to be a startup guy? Obviously I did a bunch of both, but I went down the startup path and joined this company in the mid nineties. It was monitoring vending machines like that. We just started, you've just got the public internet you had the very beginnings of primitive wireless data networks. And um, actually, a lot of people don't realize the first US, actually in the world, the first nationwide cellular network was actually called Macaw Cellular. Uh, that later was purchased and that became what you know as AT&T wireless and all that. Um, but they were, you know, I'm, I'm here in the Seattle area. The startup is in Bellevue. It's a suburb of Seattle on the other side of Lake Washington. Uh, Macaw Cellular, Western Wireless, a lot of companies that, you know, voice stream that ended up becoming things like T-Mobile and AT&T. There are a lot of pioneers in the wireless industry right here, believe it or not, in this area. And so we had a lot of investors from Macaw Cellular that helped us get along, get going with, uh, with this uh, company called Real-Time Data to monitoring vending machines. That is really kind of how I got into that space. What we think of is the Internet of Things uh, or SCADA or whatever you want to call it. We're just you're just getting data from one place and sending it to another and, you know, knowing what to do with it. We were um, and I'll go into this later, but I did that. That's where I kind of got, you know, I was just a stupid kid learning from a bunch of really smart old guys with beards, you know, luckily. And uh, like the guys who literally created the black box in aircraft. And they were all like hardcore RF engineers because we had to invent everything from scratch back then. That's why when I think about IoT or industrial IoT or things like that today, it seems relatively simple, simple to me. Comparatively, the tools, the technology is mindlessly easy compared to when you had to invent every last thing like we had to back in the 90s. Um, but, you know, it also got me down the path of wireless, I think. Um, you know. Uh, and also becoming a startup junkie, you know, like a lot of people, I did some dot com stuff. Uh, but then I created uh, when we started the very beginnings of the mobile revolution, uh, the smartphone revolution. Does anybody in the audience remember Windows Mobile or the Pocket PC or things like that? Or did, did anyone ever have a Palm Pilot or a, or an OG BlackBerry that looked a lot more like a two way pager from Skytel? Um, anyway. I built a mobile device management company. Today, you would think of those as like Intune at Microsoft or AirWatch or whatever. It's managing mobile devices for corporations. So I kind of stuck with that whole mobile thing, was building mobile apps, building stuff to manage that, sold that company. And then I joined Microsoft uh, and worked in the Windows mobile division and it became Windows Phone. Uh, does it, I don't know if anybody had one of those Windows Phones with all the tiles on it and everything. Um, so... I've seen them. I've seen them. I've not uh, yeah, personally yeah. owned one, but I, I know exactly what you were talking about. It was a thing for a while. Yeah. I mean, I'm a developer. I'm an architect, you know, that kind of thing. So I've got code running on operating systems from Microsoft that billions of people have used, or maybe dozens. <laughs> uh, it just <laughs> depends on which one. Um, but uh Spent, spent half my time in my, I was at Microsoft most of my career. And so spent half that time with Windows, Windows CE was for those of you in manufacturing and stuff like that, you know, you use a lot of embedded real-time operating systems. So if you think of the 90s and early 2000s version of that, well, actually in the 90s, 
a lot of people don't realize Microsoft had an outsized role in manufacturing. You, if you go to a lot of factory floors, you'll still see Windows 95, Windows 98, uh, Com, mm -hmm. Olay, all that stuff. That's how you got OPC, UA. <laughs> it all came from Olay, object linking and embedding, which was something you had in Visual Basic and early versions of Windows. And that kind of went down that path. But so yeah, a lot of embedded control systems running Windows CE back then. Now today, a lot of people are using Linux and other things. Um, we built, but we built a lot of CE. Like I guess yeah. from what I've seen, uh, oh, yeah. there's still quite a few uh, machines. I think most of the like Alan Bradley, especially even HMIs and some of their like SCADA platforms still run on CE. And I think okay. again, like some of it has transitioned into like Windows IoT, right? And or Windows IIoT. But I think it's just a port from uh, from CE or like I guess the next version from. And I'm just gonna say shame on Microsoft for I'm gonna say semi abandoning Windows CE. You know, because I think over time, Windows Mobile and Windows Phone was getting more love. It was built on top of CE. People didn't know it was this real-time operating system hiding under the covers. And of course, mobile devices, the smartphone revolution, that's what everyone was talking about, right? And so, it, you know, thinking about it, the embedded control systems was teeny, teeny, tiny compared to this mega trend that happened with all of us in the mobile revolution. And but it also when Windows Phone decided it wasn't going to make it, uh, I mean, we even acquired Nokia what, one last gasp to try to do that. And but, you know, Steve Jobs and company still kicked our ass with the iPhone and then Android came out um, anyway, spent the second half of Microsoft building Azure, building Azure Cloud. So the opposite of embedded and mobile doing giant mega things. <laughs> Uh, and so that was really fun building this global cloud platform. Um, specifically towards the end, I was uh, on the team that built Azure IoT, which takes us to IoT here. Um, and so it was helpful that I had all those IoT skills from the 90s where it was really hard. And it's like, hey, now we got to build this giant cloud thing uh, to let people do the Internet of Things from devices and, and design it to be global scale, design it to handle you know, 10 million messages per second of telemetry flying in, that kind of stuff and commands and all that. So that was a great experience, uh, building it, incubating it, you know, taking it to market. I used to do, gosh, 50, 75% of the executive briefings on campus at Microsoft. Uh, customers would be flying in every week. Tell us about this IoT thing. <laughs> and so I'd be there on a whiteboard telling them all that stuff. And most of them look like deer in the headlights, to be honest with you. You know, they're like, is that like SCADA? What is that? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, uh, but anyway, I got recruited out of there by Hitachi. Uh, I think Hitachi had been looking over their shoulder and saw what GE was doing. And they built Predix and they created GE Digital uh, wrapped around the Predix industrial IoT platform. Um, and so they're like, I think we need to have one of those of our own. And, you know, we all know like the big mega, mega conglomerate industrial companies like G, Hitachi, ABB, Siemens, those guys. And so uh, I got recruited in there and I got to, and we'll talk about this more, but I got to design, create, build this giant industrial IoT platform called Lumata, which was an exciting journey there and spent a lot of time in Japanese factories, which was different than factories in the Midwest, as you can imagine. But it's all a good experience, <laughs> right? It is. Um, wonderful people. Then I got, then I uh, went to Ericsson. And Ericsson is in the cellular space. You know, a lot of people, well, there were Ericsson phones in the 90s and the early 2000s and Sony Ericsson phones for a while. Uh, but they got out of that business because the iPhone sucked out of the oxygen and out of the room. And so... Uh, but they make, you know, Ericsson's a manufacturer of cellular gear and they sell to mobile operators like, like Verizon and T-Mobile and AT&T and all those guys around the world. And so uh, doing IoT from that perspective is more about connectivity and uh, and narrow band and insane broadband like we have today with 5G. So uh, lots of interesting experiences. Um, and right now I am currently building an industrial platform for to focus not on commercial purposes, but to focus on sustainability. Uh, 
Yeah. And that's something else we can talk about. Along the way, I figured out, hey, this IoT stuff can be used for a lot of things besides business. So uh, there you go. That was long-winded. <laughs> it's all get out about my background. Rob, let me ask you maybe a fundamental question, right? Because yeah. when somebody comes to me at least and tells me we would like to implement on IoT or IoT strategy, a lot of questions come to my head rather than answers, right? I cannot necessarily in a sentence tell them exactly what they're doing or what they should be doing because there's a lot of technologies that go into that, I would say, very umbrella term. So could you tell us maybe what is IoT or IIoT and then what are the key points of someone that's deploying a quote-unquote IoT strategy? Yeah, wow. You know, easy questions first. Woo! If I had a tagline for myself, it would be don't overthink it. Um, you know, looking at all that gear behind your head there, you you already know what IoT is. Um, there is some information that a machine has and you want to know about it. And in the olden days, you might look at an HMI, you might be walking around a factory or a refinery or wherever with a clipboard and writing down readings off of a gauge um and you might and i see this all today and then you'd go back and maybe you manually enter that into some kind of system some kind of system of record for that company um iot came about because there was a perfect storm i mean in a in in before i even get to the perfect storm what is it, it you know you've got a machine you've got an environmental system you just want to know the current state, the health, the performance, the state of that thing or the environment or whatever. You know, what kind of gases are in the air today? How fast is the, how, how many RPMs is that electric motor going at today? All that kind of stuff. I just want to know about it. But I, but luckily through the magic of wireless communications and little tiny computers that we call microcontrollers, um, uh, and, you know, obviously you've got your PLCs and fun stuff there. Um, they can relay that data to you. They can do it over Ethernet. There's obviously hundreds of obscure industrial protocols that no one's ever heard of that I'm sure you're very familiar with um, that don't sound anything like the Internet of anything. Um, <laughs> IP-based networking and tooling made things easier for developers to do the hard stuff that's on the wall behind you. Nobody knows about ladder logic and PLCs. Nobody does. Like we're talking about 0.01% of 1% of 0.00%. It's nobody. But a whole lot of people know how to build apps for this. And they know how easy it is to build high level using high level programming languages, not ladder logic, stuff that everybody knows and communicate over that crazy internet thing that we have that just kind of works and IP addresses, it's all easy. And so it's like, why don't we just make these machines talk to us that way instead of making it so hard for people? And so IoT is literally, I got a machine here, or like a lot of noobs who jumped into the IoT revolution and said, oh, I know what it is. It's a bunch of Raspberry Pis. That's what it is connected to the cloud. And I'm going to get data from here and I'm going to send it over here and I'm going to know it. And I'm going to look at some kind of dashboard. You know, what's an HMI? No one's ever heard of that, but they know what a web page looks like, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> With little charts and graphs on it. Well, it's the same thing, right? Um, and so it's just, but so, wait, but what may it take off? A lot of these systems are horribly expensive, they're really obscure. Uh, the tiniest amount of people know how to use them like you guys do. And we had a perfect storm where you started to get to the point of, I'm going to say near, not quite, but near ubiquitous connectivity. Obviously, you can always use Ethernet, then everybody in the building has got Wi-Fi everywhere. And then you've got cellular everywhere else. Now, where Dave is right now, he is totally borderline saying, Rob, you're so full of it with that word ubiquitous. Um, You've kind of got a little bit, you know, you got your 28.8 modem kind of going, you know, uh, to get you connected there. So a lot of connectivity, low cost, 
the cost of storage, we're talking about lots of data here, right? Data from machines, data from environmental systems, could be from people telling us the state. Instead of us visiting those places, it's just gonna tell us in real time. So I don't have to go walk over there, hop in a pickup truck, get on an airplane, get in a helicopter, in a boat. I've seen all that stuff. That's pretty normal today. Um, yeah. And so wireless gets it over here. The cost of microcontrollers of these little tiny computers were driven down dramatically because of the smartphone revolution. Smartphones said, oh my God, we need all this gear, all this technology, mo cellular modems, accelerometers, a million, there's so many different sensors and things in your device. How do we, and so as they were doing that, more people started manufacturing that stuff. And all of a sudden, all that, all those components got a whole lot cheaper. Now, obviously, right now, I can't find any of those components because of the stupid supply chain thing. But if it wasn't for that, it's like a no-brainer. And so the cost and availability of all these components to find out all these kinds of sensors, microcontrollers, small single board computers, wireless is there, storage costs, especially in the cloud, going to zero. Because when you're collecting a lot of data, it used to cost a lot of money to buy a bunch of hard drives, right? Well, now it's like, whatever, who cares? It costs almost nothing. High-level programming languages, software systems, databases, telemetry ingestion. You know, obviously, I've, I've been on both sides of the fence, both open source and, and commercial stuff. Obviously, at Microsoft, we've built a lot of great technology to build Azure. So Azure IoT, for instance to telemetry ingestion to ingest, you know, like I said, like around 10 million messages per second. Obviously that's across a lot of customers, um, but there's lots of open source stuff. Just go to apache.org and just start downloading stuff for free. You know, message queues, things to that help you build scalable systems. Um, when all that stuff comes together and also but with the other part, you connect, you collect, the data, but then what do you have to do? You, you st you're still looking for an process. outcome, right? Process. Absolutely. So you're processing that data. You're analyzing that data. So hardcore analytics tools. Obviously, we've had databases forever, and you can get a lot of data just from SQL, right? Uh, and you can do things with if this, then that even. Branching logic, simple stuff. The more hardcore stuff, you know, when you, now you're hearing people talking about machine learning all the time and I knew it, a neural network, stat, yeah, whatever, um, or AI. Well, guess what? You can go, that used to cost tens of millions of dollars and only the wealthiest companies or governments could afford that technology. Now you can go to apache.org and download it all for free. Now you still have to know how to use it, but all of a sudden the cost comes down. So now you've got tools to analyze, process that data and ultimately, what do you want to do? You want to derive an insight. And the insight is for safety. It's for making money, saving money, you know, uptime, customer support, whatever. There's a million reasons, right? And so, you know, I always say collect, you know, connect, collect, analyze, and act. You got to take an action at the end. That's the last part of IoT. If you found out something, but you didn't do anything about it, what was the whole point, right? right. So taking that action. My, I'm getting telemetry about industrial robots on an assembly line making BMWs. And because of the telemetry coming from a subsystem of one of those robots, the digital twin of it tells me that, oh, I think based on what we're seeing by about next Thursday, this robot's going to fail or a subsystem's going to fail and it's going to have a cascading effect to the whole robot, which is then going to have the line shut down. Oh, and I was just talking to the plant manager and he's like, yeah, that's about 300,000 euros an hour when the line is down. Mm -hmm. Plus we're all doing lean manufacturing. So it, there's the ripple effect, right? To your distributors and everybody mm -hmm. else. So that's no bueno. Those are the kind of people who actually write a check for this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, and that's what, you know, when you talk about industrial IoT, I think those are the kind of things that people are thinking about. Uh, and there's OT people, and then they got invaded by these IT nerds like me, who kind of straddled the fence over the years. And uh, all, and they hate OT guys, hate IT guys. They just do. 
Uh, in my experience, they're always like, all the problems that we have is because of you IT guys and your viruses and your software that crashes all the time. The software, and updates. Everything. software updates are the worst. We've it talked is. about this with some of our other guests, but man. It is. It is. And so that's that's the world we're in. And so, you know, and I really felt it a lot in Hitachi, you know, this clash of OT and IT, right? Um, GE felt it when they were trying to get the different business units to use Predix and got mm-hmm. pushback. It's like, it's our product. How do you expect customers to buy our product if our own people are pushing back on us? So it's an interesting world for sure. And it's very complicated. You know, I think we can talk about it for hours, as Dave pointed out at the beginning, but it's very mm-hmm. difficult to truly, I would say, get value out of these strategies. And I, I would say, like, to your point, Rob, keeping it simple is a key aspect, right? Because I've seen too many companies, and again, this is my experience, right? So take it for uh, for what you want, but they want to go from paper right so they have these clipboards as you mentioned or sometimes i've even seen like whiteboards where they mark down the numbers and they're like we'd like to implement ai in our facility or machine learning to figure Mm -hmm. out what's wrong and then obviously that transition i I think it's it's almost erroneous to assume that that transition is going to be simple and it relies on so many factors because i think and again we're talking about technology but there's so many factors in your plant that affect that transition that are going to um, again, make it very, very difficult to uh, to go from paper based controls into like a full online system. And and it's, you know, we're again, I, I feel like we're maybe oversimplifying in many ways, but it's very hard to, to do this right. Even from the step one of like gathering data, it might seem trivial, but there's a lot to just getting that raw data from your plant floor into like an Azure or any other cloud provider or even like an on-premises server there's a lot of technical challenges uh in absolutely that you know a lot of want to be like so when the iot thing i'm gonna i'm just gonna say i'll be wrong but we'll just say 10 11 years ago let's just say 2010 that inflection point happened because i don't want to say the iot or the collecting of telemetry and sending commands is new because it's absolutely not new we really were communicating with spaceships in the 60s And we really did know the environmental status of the astronauts coming back to Houston. So it's not like we haven't done this before, but it was all super proprietary, maybe fit for purpose, very bespoke. And money was no object, maybe in some cases. Um, Obviously, we're still sending commands to the Voyager (laughs) guy who's now in interstellar space. So we know how to do this. Again, it was, but the word I want to use, and I hate because people overuse it, it was we democratized the whole thing. It went from proprietary obscure technologies, which people like you with all your gear behind you are still using, by the way. Um, (laughs) It went from that to stuff that everybody understood. And so uh, you talk about how hard it is to get something from a machine, right? Um, When the IoT revolution got going, you saw a lot of people dive in and a lot of startups, and they were all building IoT platforms. And that's kind of like middleware. You know, I'm going to connect all these things, bring it all in, and magic's going to happen. Multi-use case, multi-scenario, multi-everything, Swiss army knife. And they probably walked into big manufacturing facilities and plants and refineries and said, yeah, we got you. We're going to come do this. We figured out how to have a Arduino and a Raspberry Pi talk to our server. And so we're going to fix everything. And those guys are like, look, like, get the hell out of my office, child. Um, What are you talking about? (laughs) You know, what do you mean Raspberry Pi? Um, Because that's where a lot of it started, you know, because, you know, there's, you know, there's always parallel things happening at the same time. So you have this mega trend with smartphones, wireless. And then this whole maker movement where makers are building all kinds of fun things on little devices, on ESP 32s and Raspberry Pis and all that. And I think a lot of people thought, well, that's what this is. And I'm just going to go, oh, and actually, Mr. Customer, I'm going to need you to rip out all that old equipment that you have and replace it with shiny new high-tech stuff that'll do it more easily. 
And again, that's a good way to get thrown out of somebody's office. Um, you know, one of my learnings doing an industrial IoT specifically, and again, industrial IoT, it's just a marketing term. It's a subset. It's, a, it, it's just a way to categorize. Remember, nothing's changed. I got a machine here. I need to get data from that machine and have it over here. And I'm going to look at it. I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to analyze it. That is all IoT is. There are uh, hundreds of different obscure file formats and wire protocols that you will use to move that data. And you might use Ethernet or you might use Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or whatever. Who cares? It's all the same stuff, right? Now, you got to get, but, and so the easy thing was, well, a Raspberry Pi, I can just write code that I understand. And I'm going to pull data from the associated sensors and I'm going to bundle it all up as a JSON file. And then I'm going to do an HTTP post because I know how to do that. Because remember, there was this other thing, this API, REST API revolution, which put a dagger in the heart of the, if, if any of you old folks remember the XML and SOAP thing that happened like the late 90s and the early 2000s, but it was really bloated. So Jason... JavaScript object notation, it's a way to serialize and deserialize JavaScript objects, was an easy way to, to serialize and transport data over some medium. So everybody jumped on that bandwagon because that's how REST APIs, lots of big companies use that everywhere. And so they're like, well, we'll use it on devices. And I'm going to pull data from this temperature sensor and humidity and whatever, and I'm going to pull it together and name value pair it, send it over, maybe send some kind of credentials a security token or whatever, my identity, you need to have each device needs to be uniquely identified. Uh, and then the server's going to catch it, look at it. Oh, who are you? Oh, yeah, I know who you are. Let me see your security. Yeah, you're good. I'm going to let you in. Um, and we're going to do something with it. And then they ran into those factory guys that go, you're not going to talk to connect to my machines. Are you insane? I have a thing called a PLC over here that maybe you can suck some data from that. And a lot of these guys are like, what's a PLC? You know, if you haven't worked in manufacturing, you have no idea what a PLC is. If you are just a normal computer person, programmer person, there's no reason for you to have ever seen or know what a PLC is or have heard of it, you know, let alone the companies that make them even though it's your whole world for lots of other people, they're like, okay, is that just some kind of computer? Well, yeah. You know, um, I am going to use my submarine though and fire a Mark 48 torpedo at all those PLCs because they're like dinosaurs still roaming the earth. They will all be replaced by more efficient, easier to use new computing devices. That's kind of a given, but you know, nothing happens overnight. Right. And I'm just here to stir the pot, of course, to make this more interesting, right, for your audience so they can hate me. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. And I mean, like, you know, there's the question of, uh, as you mentioned a bit earlier, you don't want to be the guy that walks in and tells someone, I'm going to be tearing out all those PLCs and replacing them with a new platform, even though it might be, you know, nicer, easier, like more user friendly. That's just a, a very difficult, I would say, like business value proposition unless again unless there's enough value add to justify that massive project that again could be millions of dollars right for even a single line so it's uh you're so right i i just i don't know to be honest with you like rob it, it's even i can't really picture a large facility that's standardized again i'm not gonna maybe even name the manufacturers of the plcs but you know the top three top five and yeah we all them, know them yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because there's not that many players, but how would you sell them even on let's rip all of that out and do your controls on like PCs? I'm not sure what that conversation, to be honest with you, would look like. And if there's an end user that wants to have that conversation, I'd be more than happy to entertain it. But <laughs> I think I'll be the one who gets thrown out of the room after yeah. proposing that idea. Because it's, again, there's a lot of... Um, I would say like vendor locking in, in many aspects. And you've mentioned like a few of them, right? But like these proprietary protocols that you cannot just, even if you want to replace a small part of your facility, then it no longer communicates to these PLCs that are on the remainder of your lines. And it becomes very difficult to, you 
put it in some kind of a gateway that translates and then you know that starts being like an entire mess of its own so there, there, there's yeah. a lot of questions you know like i just you just you just threw out a lot of thoughts there and i'm yeah. gonna give you the answers to how all of this is gonna happen because okay. luckily your uncle rob here with his crystal ball is going to show you how all this is going to play out so i get it the people making the plcs today they actually already see the writing on the wall and they already know how it's going to play out in the future. But like Blockbuster Video, and it looks like we just lost my video feed, didn't it? Um, There's some kind of a background, but we can still I know. hear you. Isn't that weird? Yes. So, you know, I'm using this cool, um, I'm using this cool uh, new 4K webcam, actually, hmm? that um, lets me do all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, but of course, you know, it froze on me. So there's that. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to change my video on the fly. Let's see if I get raw video. There, there go. you go. So oh, now yeah. it's not using any of the functionality. I have an AI 4K camera on my laptop that's bleeding edge new. You might have noticed when I moved around, it followed me. It's got a little cameraman yep. guy in there, you know, um, and yeah. doing other stuff. Anyways, the PLC guys know how things are going to play out eventually, but they're being like Blockbuster Video. So Blockbuster Video is looking over at Netflix, and Netflix is mm -hmm. starting out really rudimentary. We're going to mail you CDs or DVDs and movies. Blockbuster Video is like, well, maybe that's stupid. We're making so much money on late fees on people buying, not returning their VHS tapes of movies. I apologize if this makes no sense to some generation of people watching this right now or listening to it, but this is, a, this is, I'm giving you, this is, I'm giving you an education in business and marketing that'll help you. So, and, and this is a, and most of you actually know this story because people overuse this story all the time, but Blockbuster Video decided we got a good thing going and we're going to run it into the ground. And it doesn't matter that there's these upstarts with new technology like Netflix that are mailing and never having late fees. And, and then all of a sudden they started streaming. And you know what? Guess what? The Blockbuster video people had people in the company who talked about doing streaming. But the people running the show said, you know what? We got this cash cow and we're just going to keep cranking on it right up until they're out of business. and for extra trivia, if anybody is doing a little drive around the country this summer on vacation, I encourage you to go visit Bend, Oregon, home of the only blockbuster video left anywhere. The moral of the story, though, is, you know, there's always going to be barbarians at your gate. And things that you call a toy or silly stuff will eat your lunch eventually. And so, you know, me being in these giant high-tech companies, I've just lived that life. And so the way I operate today is I assume there's always barbarians at the gate, and I take them all very seriously. Like, how many people said this thing is a toy for hobbyists and makers? Were they right at the beginning? Sure. Is this the next PLC? Yeah, it is. Absolutely it is. You see um, them in many devices nowadays, right? I, I think, like, maybe not in probably plc specifically but a lot of companies are using them for again like industrial purposes and they live on uh you know like in electrical panels in many plants yeah but to your point about doing the big project when you talk about like your idea of a rip and replace project where someone comes in and says i want to rip out all those plcs and replace it with whatever whatever the next thing is it's unlikely to happen right you're you're gonna use your just like any you got all kinds of equipment that maybe is decades old and and you're gonna depreciate it and you're gonna use it until it dies and no one's gonna rip out the PLCs. It's just too expensive. It doesn't make economic sense. You know me like in my startup time when I'm bouncing between companies and being a startup junkie. You know one of the rules is whatever technology you're coming up with, either needs to be ten times better, whatever that means or 10 times cheaper than some equivalent thing out there. And so when that guy walks into your factory and says, I'm going to replace all the PLCs with X, 
that's the question you have to ask. If you want us to undertake this massive upheaval, is it 10 times better than what I have or 10 times cheaper? I bet it's not. You know, it probably isn't or it won't be for a long time. It's, but you never know. Things come out of left field all the time. Um, just like right now, there's this, um, not that you would be aware of it, but in the wireless world, for instance, I spend a lot of time in the wireless space, as you can imagine. And obviously, there's so much talk these days about 5G, right? Yep. There's also this thing called private 5G, mm-hmm. which a lot of people don't know about. So when you're inside a building, you're accustomed, you know, you're outdoors and you got your phone and it's cellular and you go indoors, you got your laptop, you got whatever, and you're, you're probably connecting to Wi-Fi. Uh, and when you had desktop PCs, it was probably connected with Ethernet. And there's Ethernet everywhere, right? That's how you have Wi-Fi access points and blah, blah, blah. Um, but there's this notion of ripping and replacing Wi-Fi with 5G, but not 5G that's on some plan with a mobile operator. It's like you buy the gear and it's your deal. You're not paying money to use it. It's just like Wi-Fi, except it's way faster than Wi-Fi and has better characteristics around going around heavy metal objects like you might see on a factory floor. Um, there is it's even a switch essentially that uh, transmits... 5G and then you can connect to it internally. Yeah. And of course, all your devices have to have SIM cards now, um, you know, and, and to make that work. They have to be cellular enabled. You know, if you're retrofitting old things, you know, whatever you're doing it has to be cellular enabled to have a SIM card. Of course, it's really secure um, because it creates this private network. You actually get a SIM card writer when you buy this gear and you create... Yeah all the sims yourself and you put them in each of your machines and it creates this encrypted network and you the only people who can be on that network are the people from the sims that you made yourself so it's 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 super secure um but it goes back to the thing we're talking about right now is that something where you're going to just flip a switch and do that rip, rip out what you've got and replace it i know siemens and a lot of other manufacturers daimler are kicking the tires on it right now. Yep. And I think and I think that's where everybody yeah. usually is. You don't just take it on faith and say, we're going to rip out all that Wi-Fi and replace it with this stuff. But people are certainly kicking the tires, something that made it more easy, this other obscure terminology, CBRS, which sounds like Citizens Band Radio, Breaker 1-9, um, <laughs> allows, because there's always this elephant in the room. There was something called private LTE that you could also have used. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is you're in a discussion with someone. You might, you might even say, "That sounds great. I want to do it." And then somewhere it's going to go, "Oh, yeah, you need to talk to Verizon or some mobile operator or AT and T and see if they will carve off spectrum for you to let you use it." Mm-hmm. And that's where things got messy and ugly and probably not weren't going to work out so much. Um, CBRS and equivalents in different countries allow enterprises to have like, hey, around my factory, maybe a mile radius around my factory in this county, in this state, I want some of the CBRS spectrum so that I can do my private 5G. Anyway, I digress, but it's but it's an example of people looking at a new upheaving, upheaval type technology. And so again, if you're a vendor of that technology, you, you absolutely have to let people kick the tires and maybe just do little small things. The boiling the ocean typically doesn't work, you know, because it, yeah, it's just too expensive and, and, and it puts your running systems at risk, right? Absolutely. Rob, absolutely. let me, I really like where this conversation is going. We do have a good question. We have actually a couple of questions, but let me read one to you that is on this exact topic. So Bob James is asking, so how do you begin the conversation to plant stuff about the migration to IoT over traditional Rockwell Honeywell, uh, Honeywell gear? What's the value add global telemetry cost? Question mark. How do you begin such a conversation? You need how, to do you, be, how do you boil the ocean? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Right. Ah, ah, ah. Well, you need to begin with the end. You need to don't do a science project that says just because everyone's saying IoT is this hot thing, just because McKinsey wrote a paper that says it's an eleven trillion dollar market. And therefore, you should all dive in and try to find that bag of money. Don't do it. Because we the, the problem, IoT has been held back from ridiculous science projects by people going, I guess we got to try it out. You need to have an outcome in mind. If you're getting everything you need from the systems you have today, then maybe you don't need to do anything. 
But if there's some data that you don't have um, from a machine, because because no doubt about it, you've got whatever X machine here, and you got PLC, and they're talking to each other here, right? You know, over some cable, RS two thirty two forty eight, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, we all know about that ancient stuff that is still used today, people in factories. It's still I know being you deployed it, today, even being deployed today. Yes, those dinosaurs are still plugging in serial ports like we used to do on DOS PCs and, you know, a million years ago. There's but anyway, parallel ports, but in, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's funny. Do you ever notice how you go to a car dealership and those guys are still using dot matrix printers? Ah. Who knew? So I guess if those guys are still alive selling dot matrix printers, then people can still sell serial <laughs> port based stuff to factory stuff. Yes, wake up, people. We replaced all that decades ago. So always start small, but start with your outcome in mind. What is it What is it you're trying to achieve that you're not already getting? You've got all your machines. PLCs are sucking that stuff off. You can tap into that, and you're getting data about the machine. Is there something that you're not getting from that machine today that you need? If there is... Maybe you can either like, you know, like sometimes you can retrofit, like in addition to the data you're already getting, if you need to put a vibration sensor or something else, you know, some environmental sensor, maybe you attach it to that machine. To, and all you're trying to do here is get some extra streams of data. Um, sometimes doing a, so like in the early days of the API revolution, I'm talking about all these revolutions, like they're a real thing. So people talked about doing mashups, right? I'm going to do a mashup here. I'm going to grip data here. I'm going to talk to weather.com here about weather and when to turn on my sprinklers. I'm going to get this and this and mash it all together. And it's going to give me more information. Well, that might be the very case that, you know, the, 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 the question here is, is about. I need more information. I'm going to mash it up with some other environmental stuff. It's going to tell me because ultimately, what am I trying to achieve? I want better uptime for my equipment. I don't want unplanned downtime. And so if this extra information, vibration, whatever things that I'm going to get that I'm not already getting, you can do that to augment it. And so it's not a rip and replace. Still get that data stream that you already got. Get those extra data streams that are giving you more context and a better picture. And then you can pull all that data. You know, I try not to overthink IoT. Literally, it's just plumbing. Okay, it seemed like magic 10 years ago or five years ago. It's just plumbing. The magic comes from the right analytics, deriving the right insight to drive the right action. And so when you get all that extra data that you didn't have and you need it and you blend it with the stuff you are getting from your PLC, and then you've got, now you've got some advanced analytics, you know, bring some more, bring some data scientists on board if that's what you need. Then you can derive an insight. Um, the other part I like is the other, there's this, you know, there's this input and output. Now, sometimes, you know, like my motor's cruising along at 10,000 RPM and I'm my temperature sensor is telling me it's getting a little hot. So maybe I have a rule that says send a command back to that motor, slow, chill yourself out to maybe 7,500 RPM because you're getting too hot. That's a pretty standard, not rocket science scenario there. But the other scenario is going the other way where you say, I know this thing's going to, based on, maybe I'm measuring bearings, ball bearings, and I know they're wearing down over time. And I'm just using something called math or calculus. Um, and I can I can deduce with the data coming that, that at what point into the future, based on the current operation, is are those things going to wear down to such a rate that you're going to have a failure, right? And so you predict... Well, in this case, I'm not trying to do ridiculous. A lot of people have been trying to do predictive maintenance and they're not having as much luck as they thought they would with the machine learning. But some of this stuff is just math. It's trends. It's trends that are already happening. And so, you know, it's all oh, this far. I can see where the end point is here and it's next Thursday. Having a system that can then say, I know it's next Thursday and I'm connected to whatever your system is to dispatch people to fix the machine, like in off time, like a planned downtime or whatever. And so you, you don't have surprises. I often tell people about IoT, before IoT, you're guessing. 
with IoT, you're knowing. When I say guessing, oh, I, I don't that. mean when I, when I say guessing, I don't mean it's a shot in the dark. It's an educated guess because you've been working with those machines for years and you you know pretty well. But it's still a guess. It's based on past history. I know I need to water my lawn every however many days at this time because I think that's what I need to do. I need to change my oil, I think, five, 10,000 miles. Maybe somebody's trying to make some more money on oil changes. I need to replace my brake pads. But guess what? All of these things are guesses, educated guess based on past behavior vaguely. With IoT, we're, let the machine tell you. Let the machine talk to you. The data is going to tell you when to change those brake pads, when to irrigate this field of crops, especially if you're in California where there's no water anymore, that might be a thing. You know, IoT in agriculture is going to be a game changer. Um, and so that's the thing there. And so having these connectors, you've got connectors from all your machines going into your IoT systems, but you also have connectors because you don't want to create nor new data silos because then you haven't yet because... All those systems that I see in factories today, they're just kind of this kind of a one-to-one -one thing. And they are a data silo. And unfortunately, a lot of the new IoT technologies and platforms, all they've done is recreate those same things just using new technology. It looks shiny or something. You've got to break out of that silo. You got to bring in data, more environmental data, and then have output outputs. And it needs to be automated. When you see IoT platforms with HMIs, all these cool dashboards and gauges and charts and cool stuff, that isn't the end game. But a lot of people pitch that as, well, I'm going to be looking. I'm in my control center sitting next to Homer Simpson in the nuclear reactor looking at what's going on everywhere. The promise of IoT is massive scalability, automated decision making. A real IoT system should be invisible, completely headless. You shouldn't have to be ever looking at any kind of thing. Data's coming in, analytics are happening, decisions are make, made on the fly, and then actions are taken. And whatever that action is, if I'm irrigation, if I've got soil moisture sensors in a field and it tells me I'm below a threshold, I need to water it, but just the right amount, not just flooding it then automation goes to an automated irrigation system and turns it on, right? Uh, but and just as important, it, as soon as it knows that the watering has gotten up to the right level, it shuts it off quickly because we need to be more precise these days with our natural resources. If you don't have something as sophisticated, it could just be a notification to a person. It could be a text message or whatever. I know that sounds kind of lame, but the same, but not all, like in the case of a farm, not all farms have automated irrigation systems. So I might need to send a message to someone who's working out in the field to go turn the valve, to turn on the irrigation, right? And just so you guys know, agriculture is part of industrial IoT. I know it doesn't feel like there's as many machines, but actually it is. Um, you should see some of the processing plants for apples. Oh, yeah. It looks like, it looks like process manufacturing, actually. Um I, I guess, Rob, I guess just to, to give you a moment uh, to take a breath, you brought up a ton of, of, of really good points. Uh, first, I think we should commend you to launching one of those torpedoes in nearly every ongoing argument that we've ever had uh, on this show in the, the last year and a half. I'm sure Vlad will spend the next uh, two weeks doing uh, some amount of damage control for everyone that uh, you've upset. And then we'll start releasing clips and we, we can reopen those wounds. So, uh, so one, congratulations <laughs> uh, for that. Two, thank you for giving us, you know, such, you know, kind of great overviews of, of IoT. I can't wait for everyone to come back to Uncle Ron, Rob's concept of IoT is just marketing jargon. Um, I, I think that, that that's going to be a very good one. I, I love the uh, the parallel of, of plumbing. So I do have a, a couple of questions for you, but first we need to thank Phoenix Contact. Um, and so we, we are, as I said, we're happy to announce that Phoenix Contact is sponsoring the theme. Uh, and we're talking about with this, how the PLC Next is an edge gateway, is a state-of-the-art IIoT, an edge computing solution. Honestly, not all that dissimilar to some of the next generation solutions that, that Rob has been talking about, but don't worry, uh, we didn't ask him to set us up for that. All right, so this is designed for data collection in, most, in the most demanding environments. Whether you have a small machine or an entire manufacturing floor, 
The PLC Next Edge Gateway leverages its advanced industrial design and programming openness to collect data from any device or sensor and send it directly to the cloud service of your choice. They like to say any data, any cloud, uh, which is very exciting. We will continue to talk more about this. Oh, Flag, do you have one next to you that you can go and show that you can go and hold up for everyone? Well, that is, Vlad, that's Vlad. beautiful. That's that nothing Thank says you. edge computing like that does. <laughs> you no, know, no, be beautiful. I, edge I computing. Say, Vlad actually has a go ahead, Vlad. Uh, I, I was gonna say Vlad actually has a course coming out at some point soon on the uh, the, the PLC next. And yes. so I just have to uh I just have to, to go and uh I have to go in and prop that because you know no one's asking about it on this show in, in weeks as to when that's going to uh, as to when that's going to uh, to launch. But no, so I think this is going to kind of set you up for the, the next question. But we you, you've talked about IoT, you've talked about how it's kind of plumbing. You have started a new company. It's an IoT company, and it's focused on sustainability. Is is that correct, Rob? It is. It is. Yeah. Since I know how, since I still write code and design systems, you know, I got to be one of the co-architects for Azure IoT and I totally designed Lumata, which is running in factories everywhere. And so I know how to build this stuff. But as I alluded to earlier, over time, I started to find that, gosh, it doesn't have to just be about commercial stuff or it doesn't have to always be about making money. What is IoT? I'm measuring something remotely and getting a measurement. And then I'm making sense of that and taking an action. Well, maybe those measurements can help me with climate. Maybe those measurements can help me with water or forests or agriculture, you know? And so I found myself over the years doing research and I started having to be speaking at conferences, doing keynotes around things that I had to learn about. Um, that were more about sustainability for the whole planet, um, panel discussions and stuff like that. And so one of the things that helped me, and I'm sure some of your audience is familiar with it, but if you haven't heard about it, the United Nations a while back came out with something called the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030 for the whole planet to reach. There's 17 of them. And it really helped me categorize ways that IoT could help in these areas. I don't believe IoT is the answer for everything, but it could be a helper, right? So mm -hmm. you have so you the sustainable development goals are called the SDGs or SDG one, two, three, four, whatever, up to seventeen. Poverty, hunger. It turns out both of those are very related to agriculture. The poorest people in the world actually work in agriculture. Hunger, well, duh, has to do with getting food on the table. And so um, that's where I really started to dive in. Like last year, I, I built this technology called Thunderstruck uh, while I was at Ericsson and, and did a bunch of trials on some farms uh, to, to help be more precise in irrigation and some other things. Uh, and that, that was a real eye-opener for me. And it was eye-opener for the farmers too. You know, while you've got these systems and factories that are giving you visibility to what's going on, the average farmer hasn't seen that kind of visibility. They have to walk around, get in the pickup truck, get on an ATV to go visit. Just like I told you, I'm visiting a machine to take a reading. Someone on a farm is visiting to say, is there enough water here? Do I see weird colors on the leaves of this plant that maybe is telling me disease is about to come in, right? I've heard that they've tried to use uh, drones for that purpose. Yep. But again, I don't know how uh, widely spread or how effective that is, but th there's a lot of development there for sure. Absolutely. The drones do spectral analysis from above. And so they're looking at the canopy of the plants, or it could be an orchard, maybe it's apple trees, stuff like that. And through spectral analysis, they can detect uh, the emergence of problems, of pests, of disease. They, they're also used for thinning out. You know, there's all kinds of obscure stuff there in that whole world, obviously. You know, one of the key things, too, I want to reiterate about IoT, there's the technology and the ability to get data from something move it somewhere where you can take action, but it's so critical to pair up the IoT tech people with domain experts because they are not experts in your business. 
And so you've got to be matched up with it. And so I'm out there in farms, but I'm not a rocket scientist farmer. And so I'm paired up with farmers and agronomists who've been doing this their whole lives. And they tell me, hey, Rob, for this soil type and this crop, this is the ratio. This is just like when you do it in factories today. You do threshold based stuff, you know, above, below a certain threshold, have a trigger and action. Same thing. And so pair up with people who actually know what they're talking about. Don't be a know it all, be a learn it all. And pair up with people who know their stuff, leave arrogance and that attitude at the door and be open to learning about those fields. And so, because remember, IoT, I'm just moving data around and I'm going to help you out. And so agriculture, as it turns out, has a labor shortage. Um, they've got problems with water. They've got, obviously, you've heard lately, you know, we've, we've got um, supply chain issues. We've got some stuff going on with Ukraine that's going to cause lots of hunger for a lot of people. We've got a depleting fertilizer that people didn't realize. Uh, there's all kinds of things that happen under the covers that a lot of folks don't know about, right? And so... How do we be more precise in helping folks out like that? Um, anyway, the technology I'm building, it, it does a lot of this IoT stuff and analytics specific to these sustainable fields. And, and so what I'm doing is building the technology. It'll be free for education. It'll be free for nonprofits, non-governmental organizations, you know, NGOs, people who are trying to help. It'll be coupled with recipes, use cases that are appropriate. I'm going to say, here's the technology and here's what I want you to do with it. I need you to monitor this, this, and this, and here's how it works. And here's the analytics and outcomes to help this village in Africa with this problem with water or whatever it happens yep. to be. What's the last part of the equation? It's people. It's just, it still comes down to people. None of this stuff happens without people. And so, you know, in if it's if it's a company using this technology, it could be you know you've heard the term ESG, you know all these they companies now have these commitments, these ESG commitments, and they need to monitor it. So they could use a technology that like I'm building this thing called Greenhouse to do that. People who don't have any money, who are nonprofits, who are helping people around the world, they'll use this thing for free along with the recipe that tells them what to do. So that they can move the needle and make an impact in those people's lives. Um, anyway, you know, after a while, you know, you realize there's a lot of challenges in this world. And if you can match up maybe something you're good at with some bigger problems or something you're passionate about and put those together, you know, why not? Um, and so, you know, ultimately, it's just, it, you know, you're just you're trying to pitch in, right, and help out where you can. I, I love that, Rob. I, I think that that kind of that, that probably answers the, the first wrap up question that I ask everyone. Is, is that the future? Is that the future of IoT? Is that the future of the world? Is is that what we should be more focused on as opposed to the ten millionth and one, uh, you know, business case for IoT? You know, it'll always be a combination. You can't get people in business to blow off what they're making the next quarter, right? Um, they're using yeah. people are using IoT in business for massive efficiency, right? And to reduce costs in every way possible and make more money and new business models. And that's why they're doing IoT and safety and all kinds of things. But there's another side of that coin, right? That says, well, by golly, I can use this technology to make the world a better place because we've got challenges that are facing all of us. Um, not everybody's aware of these challenges. Um, it's getting a little toasty outside in certain parts of the world. Uh, the water's disappearing in other parts. Some parts are getting massive flooding and parts of Europe are getting massive flooding in the summer while the Western United States seems to be on fire every summer and there's no water in California. And so um, it turns out, you know how a lot of people just kind of sleepwalk through life and they just go do their job and punch the clock it'd be great to wake up some of the sleepwalkers to have that awareness, to look around and go, Hey, it's possible that it's actually all hands on deck time to help solve some of these problems. And again, technology isn't the whole answer. It's just, it's just part of the equation. It's still, it takes people and it takes action. Um, but whatever you can do to help, you know, if I'm monitoring to early detection for forest fires, 
if you can nip it in the bud, find out the fire is beginning right at the earliest part where you can where you can take care of it. You know, water quality, water diminishing, things like that. Heat, you know, what came along with the fires in Western United States? Horrible air quality. As it turns out, you have people working outside really in all these farms. If you drive across any country, you'll realize most of the country's land is dedicated to farming. Um, mm -hmm. I know when you live in a city, you think it's just buildings and factories, but that's actually the tiniest part of your country, no matter what country you're talking about. The biggest part, all the lands used for farming. And we're doing lots of great innovation there with in, in, inter, indoor farming, vertical farming, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and I don't want to overemphasize farming. That's just one use case. Um, but yeah, lot, lots of stuff. Cleaning the oceans, you know, I'm a big fan of that since I used to live under the sea on submarines. Um, yeah. I actually kind of care about that. Energy. How can we reduce energy consumption in a factory, on a bullet train? Well, you can monitor energy usage with IoT, with devices, right? Mm -hmm. Put that thing in between the plug and the wall and the machine, and you can find out how much current it's pulling, right? Maybe there's newer versions of that machine that are more energy efficient, that don't use as much electricity, right? Things like that. Our factory, I also want to do that's a, an important discussion topic too on that same uh, train of thought. Yeah, absolutely. We got we need energy. I also wanted to, you know the the PLC next thing about edge computing, Vlad. I wanted to give some context around edge computing. I don't want people to think it's just yet another marketing mega trend. Hey. Like a whole lot of people who didn't win the hyperscaler cloud war sweepstakes, those are the people who started saying, well, maybe you should go multi-cloud. They're also the same people who said, well, the edge is more important than the cloud. But it turns out it's important. I'm going to give you a quick example. Early days of Azure IoT, incubating this new technology, cloud-based IoT technology. And I'm at a the largest manufacturing facility in the United States that's not far from where I live. And people can guess what that is. They build the biggest things you can build. And I'm telling them all about how cool Azure IoT is and they can send telemetry and we have streaming analytics and machine learning and Power BI dashboards, it's gonna be awesome. And they were saying, Rob, that's great. Show me the version that runs right here on the factory floor. And I'm like, huh? And they go, and I'll tell you why. I have these giant machines that I used to build even bigger machines and they're spitting out mm -hmm. terabytes of data per hour. And I can't afford to ship that expensive data continuously over expensive bandwidth to your distant cloud so that you can munch on that data for a while and then maybe give, you an, give me an answer to a question, whatever it happens to be. I need it in milliseconds. I need it right here locally. And I think that was the first time I thought about edge computing. And it wasn't because some marketers or some industry analysts from Gartner or IDC said, this is the future. It's just practical common sense, right? Mm -hmm. I need that compute right there on the factory floor, right next to the machines. And that's what edge computing is all about, getting closer to the source of data, doing it, pushing analytics to the edge, you know, whether it's simple analytics or ML. That whole tiny ML thing, we're putting things on microcontrollers even, but it could be on a rugged PC, right? Like you see a lot of times edge computing and things like you're showing us here. That's the value there. I need millisecond answers to questions. I need to know a safety concern is going to happen instantaneously, not after it goes chugga, 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 a thousand miles away over a bandwidth, and then it figures out there and comes back to me. That latency is unacceptable. Um, so there's your edge computing in a nutshell. It's super valuable. No, absolutely. And I, I, I really I that. like that point. I, I was going to say like, also like I've seen it used very widely, it, at least in the industrial space for data aggregation, right? Cause as you mentioned, there's so yeah. many different mm -hmm. protocols. And then if you want to come in and just try and get the data from each one of those devices directly into the cloud, you're just going to run into a scalability issue. You're going to have to translate all of that and, try and make sure that that data is, you know, accurate and gets to you, it becomes very difficult, right? So edge gateways, I've seen them used as like, here's the collection point, and then it funnels into uh, into the cloud. But I wanted to ask yeah. you, you know, a question on the cloud side, because again, yeah. I've, I've been hearing a lot about 
the IoT and even the IIoT solutions from most cloud providers. But I'm curious, again, because I've not seen them deployed in manufacturing places that I've worked at, at least. What's the, so the target market, right? So there's a lot of IoT that is not manufacturing, right? So all the vehicles now have sensors that can send data. All the, like you've mentioned, like a lot of the trains or even the city infrastructure sends data. So I'm curious, what is maybe the size of that market? Are you seeing a lot of industrial plants go with a, you know, a dedicated cloud solution? The I know that AWS has like IIoT specific like module, same for Azure. And, and I would assume that Google has them as well. Or do you see them deploy on, again, like just basic computing instances and use their own services? Because again, I've also had this conversation on the price side where they stream so much data that it becomes maybe more expensive for them to use those modules versus going with just, we're going to spin up a new a compute instance. We're going to spin up again, whatever is required, like the load balancers and make sure that everything communicates. But like, what are your thoughts on that? Are people using those IIoT specific like modules at scale? Is there greater adoption? Do you see more manufacturers go towards them versus again, spinning off their own like servers and even going like on-prem for that matter? Versus cloud. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with on-prem. Um, the, the, I'm seeing a lot oh. of, you know, <laughs> I'm seeing, there is a lot of uptake. I'll say there were, I would say the, the cloud IoT players were late to the party with industrial. They did baby steps and, you know, we're probably doing more consumer looking things or what I would say is also greenfield scenarios where you're doing something from scratch. I'm building an IOT toaster or a pump or a whatever. And it's got communications, you know, built into it to do that. But industrial is harder because of all those ridiculous protocols and serial ports hanging out everywhere and PLCs and HMIs and MESs and a million other things all entrenched, right? And so it's taken longer. Um, my good friends at Microsoft, just down the road from me, you know, have been deeply involved in no PC, um, deeply involved in a lot of the organizations. And so I think what they had to wake up and realize is there's no mod bus from a factory to the cloud. It doesn't exist. There's MQTT, there's REST, there's AMQP, there's some long range protocols, but the 100 or 200 or 9 million protocols that are in a factory, those aren't, they're not long range protocols or short range deals. And so I th it takes you back to edge computing. And so that's when you started seeing Microsoft do Azure IoT Edge. You saw Amazon come out with Greengrass. And now they're even doing bigger things, you know, and trying to push more of their cloud onto on-prem gear, right? So they provide like a hardware solution, I guess, that, well, I guess it it's is. a software solution that runs probably like on a, on a Linux machine in the... In it, the... It, 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 it absolutely is. And so it's, it's, it's hardware that has some portion of the cloud in it specialized, but, but supported. And, you know, obviously they all have their own particular details, but I think the, you, you can't get around physics, right? You know, some stuff just can't make it work. And no matter how badly you want your cloud to be an industrial IoT cloud, no, you're gonna have to have an edge component. You're gonna, but the cloud's helpful, the data may eventually end up in the cloud. A lot of data will not go to the cloud because you might figure out the answer to your question locally and you should whenever you can, absolutely. Um, the telecom world with the launch of 5G is trying to use edge computing to put edge compute in base stations. So like when you're driving around, you see the cell towers. Mm -hmm. Do you ever notice at the bottom of the cell tower is like little, some little shack, a little shed or something there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's computers and stuff in there. And they're going to put using containers, container technology. You know, everybody learned about Docker and Kubernetes and all that kind of stuff. D pushing it's slowly getting into manufacturing, slowly getting, but it's, yeah, yes. but 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 having that compute closer, and you know, because the problem is is clogging up bandwidth by always sending things to a distant cloud. Right, the cloud's yeah. always been this kind of hub and spoke, one to many thing, um, and so all the all the mobile operators and the People who like I've worked for Ericsson and others who've been working on how do we reduce the amount of clogged data clogging up networks if we push edge compute closer. And so we think of far edge, like edge right on the factory floor, 
could be a little thing like you're showing me could be servers and you know and then things and then at the edge of the cellular network at a base station so you're talking to the tower it goes down there's something called a front hall network if you can do compute and get the answer there and go right back to the person without going out onto the open internet on the back hall network well then you're you gonna on bandwidth. Yeah, yeah. you're gonna yeah. save on bandwidth and you're gonna as long as the, and so ultimately it comes down to your latency requirements, right? Or a good friend of mine, she referred to a derived uh, insight time. Um, I'm not even saying it right, but anyway, you you have a requirement. I need an insight in one millisecond or one nanosecond, or but if it's 30 milliseconds, maybe I can wait till it goes here, not all the way to the cloud, but maybe right to the edge of the cellular network. You've heard weird terms called edge cloud. You, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, people are going crazy obviously trying all kinds of things, you know, in the end, the edge is just a location, right? The edge can be right on the machine. And so it could be something that's aggregating a bunch of machines, or it could be right on the machine if you have enough compute. When I talked about the future changing away, it's going to be done by the OEMs who are making these giant machines. So when I spent time at Hitachi, what do you think we were talking about with the future when we're building Lumata? We're also thinking, Huh. Well, right now, industrial IoT means in order for us to be successful, we have to retrofit old stuff for decades to come. But we need to get out of that cycle at some point. And so what we need to do is on all the new machines that are being built, those machines need to have compute, storage, power, and networking software baked into them at time of manufacturing. So that when it comes off the assembly line, and then you use it in your own factory or your own whatever, you don't have to have a PLC or an MES or whatever stuff. These guys are, have the smarts right out of the box. We see that in consumer IoT, but we need to see that in the industrial space. Uh, another good example, one of the largest pump manufacturers in the world, uh, Grunfoss in Denmark, worked heavily with us at Ericsson to put that compute storage networking in a cellular module to do cellular 5G or whatever, right from the pump directly so that you don't have to create this crazy maze or pathways of getting that data to where it needs to go. And so I think over time, you will see more and more equipment have that kind of intelligence baked right in uh, from the get-go. And I think that makes a lot of sense, right? Like uh, bringing back to your example of the cell tower, the same could be said about manufacturing and I guess the pricing of... Uh, cloud services, if you can process on the edge, then you don't necessarily need to send all those streams of data and thus like saving on the, uh, I would say like on the costs of various like cloud services. But it's interesting yeah. to be honest with you, I've, I've not had the, I guess the opportunity to work on such solutions. And I know it's going to be extremely hard to figure out what the, the right balance is of processing at the edge and getting those solutions to the stakeholders at the facility versus let's send that out and then do the processing in the cloud, send it back. And again, there's, there's a lot of, I would say like questions that play even from like a business cost perspective. And, and I'm sure there's probably answers from, from those providers, right? Like how much those edge modules are going to cost and what the streams of data are going to cost and how you can optimize that. And I'm sure there's a ton of engineering probably also involved in making sure that the cost and the solution is optimized. But it, it, in my head, at least, there's a lot of uh, a lot of questions on that. Topic. Yeah, I don't want anyone to ever think that the cloud is somehow a requirement for IoT. Just like you've seen that meme for a few years now, where it just says the cloud is just someone else's computer. Yes. <laughs> take take that to heart. So when I was designing Lumata at Hitachi, I purposely designed it to be portable. Because if you're because we were building an industrial IoT platform, not just a generic IoT platform. And I talked to the guys, it's, it's a magic what happens when you actually talk to customers, you find out so much. Um, you know, I talked to the guys who run the plants, the factories. You know, you're obviously with Hitachi, our first customer is us. And guess mm -hmm. what? A whole lot of those people say the data doesn't leave my factory, period, mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And so when you're faced with that, if you're Microsoft and Amazon, you might say, oh, well, we'll pass on you for a while because we have unlimited cash and we can wait. 
But for an upstart like us, you have to meet the customer where they are if you want to be successful. Yep. And so we made sure without saying the word edge or whatever, that Lumata was portable. And so it could run in any cloud or in VMware or on bare metal, and it could run on the factory floor. And it actually ran on Hitachi bullet trains. And uh, gosh, the, you know, flexibility. I used to say ridiculous things to engineers developing Lumata. I was like, think like a salesman. And they're like, that is the dumbest thing I ever heard, Rob. Uh -huh. um, but what I meant by that is by the way you develop software and the way you architect it, do it in such a way that it makes it easier for the customer to say yes. A lot of times people build technologies that are harder to sell than others. And so if you build it and design it in such a way that when a customer is throwing out their objections or I need it to do this here, can it work here? Can it work in VMware? Can it work whatever? We need to be able to say, yes, 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 it does. Yes, it does. Absolutely. Yes, it'll run on a train. Yes, it'll run wherever you need to. Hitachi makes nuclear reactors. We're not dumb enough to build a cloud solution because a great way to get fired is to connect your nuclear reactor to the internet. Ah. You know, yeah, oh. it's no bueno. You I might have a little earlier. You I might have late. a little you might have a Stuxnet problem eventually, like the Iranians did with their centrifuges. And so, yeah, don't do that. Don't be stupid. <laughs> I was going to say, the only way you'd convince me to have a command center you you were mentioning earlier of a nuclear reactor is if I can be remote. You know what I mean? It's, I would sit somewhere <laughs> remote and then I'm controlling the nuclear reactor. But obviously, uh, that, that, that would not be feasible. I used to sleep right next to a nuclear reactor and in between these giant yeah. missile tubes. Uh, but it's, yeah. it, it, it makes you all tingly inside and toasty. So that's good. You know, <laughs> I agree. So, so Rob, I, I feel like you've given so much good advice, uh, especially don't connect your nuclear reactor to the internet. Um, uh, I, I guess we're going to ask you for, for a little bit more advice. Uh, so we like to ask for career advice, uh, on this show. So maybe we typically say kind of early or mid career. So if someone is early or mid career, Maybe they're looking to get into industrial. Maybe they're looking to get into IoT of some sort. What would be your advice for them? Yeah, I, I think I have pr probably two views of that. Um, you know, it's easy to get advice that says, hey, go learn how to be a programmer. You know, go learn Python or Go or C Sharp or whatever, you know, Java, something like that. Be a programmer so you can build it and go use, learn. You know, there are a lot of pillars or components that make up IoT. Each one of those components, one of the, I talk often about what has held IoT back from where we thought it would be. Part of it is the intense complexity. And so over here, if you can learn the stuff that's behind Vlad on the wall there, if you can learn that gear, wherever you learn that at, do you learn it in college? Do you go to a technical college? Do you learn at OJT working at an industrial company? Learn that stuff. The device side is the most complex in my mind. And it's the hardest part, to be honest with you. I find building the big giant stuff to be actually much easier than the tiny stuff. Um, and so learn about the hardware, embedded software. If I'm going to build software that's running on those machines to do this magic, um, I'm going to have to know probably low-level languages. If it's a tiny microcontroller, I'm probably going to need to learn C, right? Um, of course, we are trying to send some love with MicroPython to help Python people do things in small places on microcontrollers. And then as you get a little bit bigger, then you can do some higher-level languages. But remember, Efficiency, both in bandwidth and power, is important. If I'm in a factory and I'm plugged in the wall, maybe I don't care. And I've got Wi-Fi or Ethernet. If I'm on a farm, all of a sudden, how many CPU cycles, how much data I'm sending is eating my battery life? And maybe it's yeah. charging me money for going over a wireless network, cellular. So learning about efficient code on embedded devices, efficient ways of sending data over there, there's the whole network part, learn about networking, every kind of networking, the stuff, your LAN, your WAN, 
your VLAN, all that stuff, that's a field that plays a role in there. Obviously, there's the short range stuff. Go find some old books and learn about how to do serial port programming. <laughs> um, you know, it's crazy talk. I think it's no. going to be here for a while. You know, like it we, is. we all laugh about it, but I oh, think it's yeah. going to take it is. A, a decade, if not more, to. Uh, yeah, to absolutely. It is. And so learn that if you want to go learn how to program a PLC, you know, you know, there's great online courses, too, out there from folks like Pluralsight and other uh, training deals. There's a lot of them out there where you can learn at your own pace on the web. Um, on the cloud or the server side, you know, you're learning about big things, you know, b b APIs, the, the larger wire protocols, uh, authentication, message queues, you know, message buses, you're learning about the one the words I didn't use that, that are my Bailey week like, is actually digital twins, which is a way to model things. And it's a data structure and digital twins are hot. Digital twins are, you know, actually came from manufacturing primarily. Um, that's how I learned about them originally. Uh, but that's getting hot. It's a way to model data and then views of that data it could be a 3D model and stuff like that, like a, from Dassault systems or whatever. Um, learn go learn you know go learn those analytics tools start but start with just database stuff be good at a database start with a relational database learn how to do sql learn how to do that stuff then you can learn some of the nosql stuff then you can if you want to dip your toe into trying to learn some of this more advanced machine learning there's a lot of work, people working on making that easier it used to be you had to be a phd stats person to do that obviously a lot of work's been done to you know so that other people Obviously, it's truly happening. Like you may have heard, you know, like TensorFlow, for instance, yep. is uses Python. You know, that's a Google thing. And you hear great stories about some, you know, 13-year-old kid who wrote some TensorFlow things, analyzed pictures, and was able to detect the beginning of cancer, of skin cancer things, you know, stuff like that. So we're always trying to abstract software to make it simpler so you don't have to be some rocket scientist all the time. Um, cybersecurity across the whole board, we need more cybersecurity experts in this world. Mm -hmm. We are all getting hacked to death 24 seven. Just everybody is. You don't know it, but there is a war going out on the internet. If you I might as well pu publicly post, you know, my credit card info, but because like the banks, uh... the whatever else like it is getting hacked and the information gets leaked like on a daily basis. And that's just the you know, the ones that we hear about, but yes. I yeah, I would highly encourage people to, you know, that's a great career path, actually, I or T or otherwise. We need way, way more cybersecurity experts because there's literally, I know it sounds like hyperbole, but there literally is a cyber war going on actively every day on the internet. Nation states, individual actors are stealing data, stealing IP, blowing up systems, stuff like that. Shame on us because we said, hey, let's put everything on the internet. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, and it's, uh, I think it's only going to get worse. Like, again, not to yeah. take a hard tangent on that, but they've discovered multiple vulnerabilities. I don't know if you follow the manufacturing space per se, but on many controllers that, again, are being deployed today, there's very, I don't want to say like obvious, but uh, fairly basic vulnerabilities that have been discovered. And, mm -hmm. you know, going back to, the Windows CE example, well, maybe once it got discontinued, however many years ago, it's not as uh, as reliable from a cybersecurity standpoint, but it's still on the network and many plant uh, manufacturing plants, and it's prone to hacks that aren't that you know like advanced or cutting edge per se. So that's just a, right. a side note that, on that. That's a great example. People continue to use unsupported software all over the world. Um, the fact that I can see Windows 95 and Windows 98 on factory floors connected to machines, Windows XP, when I was at Microsoft, all we did was try to get people to stop using Windows XP. And it was the hardest thing we ever did. And we probably didn't succeed because uh, it just worked. Everybody loved XP. It just worked. It was, you know, no frills, just awesomeness. Yep. And so, and you tell them, well, it's out of support. You better upgrade. People are like, yeah, whatever. And so it's just... <laughs> 
you, you nailed it, Vlad. You nailed it. All those CE devices, all those old Windows machines all over the place that are out of support. Microsoft's not giving them new updates. And so they're, you know, every you've heard of zero day exploits and attacks. Like, how do you think Stuxnet happened in Iran? It was, I think, a bunch of zero day flaws known on that version of Windows on certain yep. PLCs that allowed worms to hop from place to place and do their dirty work. And so uh, keeping your up systems updated, I know it seems like a pain to keep them updated with the latest security patches, um, but it's critical because yeah, it's it's war out there. Um, so yes, a lot of career opportunities for, for people getting started or whenever uh, in cybersecurity. Um, gosh. I, you know, when I was, I, I think there's another world that I, I want to provide education to because I don't want it to just be a bunch of techie, geeky programmer people. We need, in the same way that we have at community colleges and junior colleges or technical colleges, I'm going to learn to be a welder. I'm going to learn to be a plumber. I'm going to learn, you know, whatever. There is a class of IoT people that we need that aren't programmers but they are the boots on the ground people who are going to deploy and maintain these systems and make it real. Um, a lot of people gloss over that critical element. They're like, yeah, we built this great technology. Here you go. And it's like, people need to know how to install and deploy these hard things, even though they're not a programmer or whatever, they need to be able to go out throughout a factory and deploy those properly to the machines, get everything configured, that whole system and you need people hanging around for support to maintain it. And a more extreme example, which I faced last summer when I'm hanging out on farms all summer doing IoT was, oh my God, if I what if I'm deploying only one device and associated sensor per acre, but I've got to deploy it across 10,000 acres. We're talking about, I need a lot of literal boots on the ground, cowboy boots on the ground yep. uh, and pickup trucks to deploy things in these farms and orchards and places like that and ongoing maintenance. When it's outside, all kinds of crazy stuff can happen, like storms, like rain, like snow, somebody knocking into it, animals. And so all of a sudden you've got devices that are in weatherproof containers. We kind of talked about battery life, bandwidth. You're gonna need people to replace batteries. You're gonna need at scale, you should expect devices to be failing every day. Lots of them. Like if you're big time at scale, just like all the hyperscale cloud players or Facebook, the whole thing, the whole thing is designed for failure. It's designed, they know servers are failing, multiple servers are failing every day, but the software is holding it together. The same should happen at giant scale with IoT deployments. It, it just is gonna happen. You can't fool yourself, right? Things happen. And so, Hardware fails, wears out, whatever. And so we need a class of people. And I think we train them in, in community colleges and technical colleges. Maybe I need to write up the curriculum to teach for this. But I think for IoT to really take off and change the world the way we want it to be, I think we need a whole new class of IoT practitioner who can do that kind of work. Um, just like Just like being a plumber, just by being an electrician, just like being a welder. I, so I really love that there. example. I really like that point, Rob, because, uh, you know, like now thinking back of uh, what you've said, I've had a lot of trouble even with a basic task like getting people to crimp uh, Cat6 cables, right? And that's a massive challenge, again, at scale in every new facility that's being developed. How and do you crimp this damn thing? It's, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, you know, if you've done a lot of practice, it's fairly straightforward, but I, I can tell you that it's not as fail-proof as one may think, right? Like you start testing and then if it's, you know, a dozen cables, sure, you can probably get through it fairly quickly. But again, in the IoT scenario, in manufacturing at least, you start having these hundreds, if not thousands of connections and then chasing your tail around the facility, trying to figure out which cable hasn't been crimped correctly. That's... Again, like that's something very directly related to IoT and has been a challenge, at least like for my projects in the past. Absolutely. You know, there's probably a lot of stuff just on basic tech stuff like you're talking about, maybe like the, what is it, the A plus certification stuff you see out there? 
um, is probably a good start for folks. Uh, but yeah, I, I think, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities that we've enumerated here for, for folks who want to get into that space. Lots of skills are needed to, to bring the magic to life, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I think all of those are, uh, are very good pieces of career advice. Uh, and I think that it goes back to kind of our need in general for more skilled uh, technicians, right? We need skilled technicians in, in all all professions, all skilled trades, and that is only be going going to become a larger and larger of a need as we deploy additional sensors, additional IoT uh, style solutions in the middle of nowhere. Uh, yeah. And and with that, uh, with that, Rob, we we did warn you about Vlad's favorite segment uh that, that we like to joke is the uh the hashtag not sponsored audible segment in which i ask you for a book recommendation and then vlad goes and uh, downloads it and maybe listens to it at some point next year just based upon how many great book recommendations we've had but do you have a book recommendation or some good content recommendation uh that, that you've enjoyed yes oh my gosh hang on i'm such a loser i'm you know like I'm loading my Audible app right now to tell you what I'm going to say because I'm just in time unprepared. Um, a real shocking one that I'm listening to right now, it, and the people at Apple are going to hate me. There's a book that's out now called After Steve, and it and it kind of talks about Johnny Ive, who is the designer for the iPod and all, iMacs and all that kind of stuff, and how that relationship and how things have changed at Apple. Obviously, they've made trillions, but some people say they've lost their soul along the way. Um, Interesting. I guess. Let me see. Could you give us maybe a? Te have you listened or read the book? Which I listened. Audio? I'm listening. All right. I did listen to. If you're into rock music and you love the Foo Fighters and Dave Grohl, who I think is a great guy, mm -hmm. who is single-handedly keeping rock and roll alive, I would highly listen. Uh, listen to Storyteller. It's he kind of did an autobiography about him being a teenager, dropping out of school to be a drummer in a punk band, and then traveling around, having no money, bumping into Chris Novoselic and hooking up with Nirvana, and realizing they had no money until Nevermind came out. They were he was sleeping on a couch in an apartment in Olympia, Washington, and um amazing story if if you're into the history of music like i am you know and it but it's also i think it's a great story on that can relate to anybody how much are you willing to sacrifice individually for a big dream you know because everybody thinks they're all a bunch of instant millionaires and the reality is they're sleeping in cars and have no money and as Dave Grohl said, he was living off the corn dogs, the three corn dogs for whatever dollars at the AM PM Arco store um, for a long time. And he lost a lot of weight because of it. But luckily, everything worked with out uh, with Nevermind. And so that was good. Also, maybe a weight really loss tip for the rest of us. Start, start it's a weight loss rest. tip. Maybe not, maybe not the healthiest weight loss tip, corn dogs, but why not? You know. I really enjoyed Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. Um, he talks about his career and he talks about seeing those green lights, like a street light, you know, red light, yellow light, green light. He talks about the green lights and when you need to jump on things and take advantage of it or when red lights can turn to green lights. The reason I would recommend both the Dave Grohl and the McConaughey book on Audible is because they both read the books themselves with their voice and so you can imagine matthew mcconaughey going all right all right all right so there i was you know yeah. at university of texas and i you know was in some kind of slasher movie and then you know anyway it makes it more enjoyable when you hear their voice and their inflections because mm -hmm. they have pretty iconic voices so that so those are both kind of autobiographies. Dave Grohl, The Storyteller, and Green Lights from Matthew McConaughey. Uh, if you're driving around the country this summer on a vacation, just download an Audible. It's a great way to, to pass the time, right, when you're driving on a big road trip. Um, I know I found that to be helpful for me. 
Absolutely. No, I think all of those are very good books. I, I have heard positive reviews of all three. Uh, none of those three have yet made it to the top of my queue, but I, I think they're getting going to get bumped further up. Uh, la- last question uh, for you, Rob. You have been so generous sharing all of this information with us. Who should reach out to you? You know, you, you started a new company. You know, are you looking for people to help you? Are you looking for customers? What, what does that look like? How can the, the listeners help you? Yes. So I know to start to death. It... <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so, you know, right, you know, right now, you know, I've done the startup thing before. And I've done it the right way and the wrong way in every way. And, you know, right now, I'm kind of doing some consulting to keep the lights on, right? While doing your build, build the thing and, um, yep. and your passion. But yeah, um, definitely people should reach out to me. You can always find me on LinkedIn. I'm you know, and Rob Tiffany on Twitter, uh, this new technology, though, Greenhouse, uh, it's certainly there to help society, but it can also help business help meet their ES- ESG goals and stuff like that. So definitely reach out to me. Uh, the new company is is going to be called Sustainable Logics with an X. Um, and so, yeah, it's 100% about sustainability. So, yeah, big, a big definitely jumping off the a diving board into the deep end here for sure. Um, so we'll see how it plays out. Fingers crossed. And Rob, I'll mention that there have been other questions, you know, amongst the viewers. We obviously yeah. didn't get to many of them, um, okay. but uh, I will encourage everyone who has posted a question on LinkedIn, as well as on YouTube to reach out to Rob directly. And we'll have those links uh, by the way, yeah. you've mentioned, you know, LinkedIn profile. So that's going to be all posted on uh, on our website in case you're driving and listening to this in audio form. But we'll definitely make sure to pass the message along. I got one more book for you. It's an oldie, but okay. it goes along the lines of how good a book can be when it's the iconic author reading it. Mm-hmm. And for all, all you fans of Anthony Bourdain, God rest his soul. Listen to Kitchen Confidential. That really got his career going because he kind of blew up the whole restaurant industry and what was really going on behind the scene in kitchens. But when you hear his voice reading that thing, it's just like magic. And if this IoT stuff doesn't work out for me, I'll probably just open a food truck, you know, and try my best. Ah. The best, the best compliment I ever got was someone said I'm the Anthony Bourdain of IoT. Just total rebel. <laughs> interesting, interesting. I love it. <laughs> I, you have to be into food and cooking, obviously. I know it's not for everybody. I I love it. So, so Rob, the Anthony Bourdain of IoT, we will promise to have you back at some point uh, to, to, one, continue this conversation, and, and two, kind of maybe dig in more on the sustainability side and, uh, and figure out, uh, where you're going and, and what that's that's going on from there. Uh, but no, I, I would say that this has been an amazing conversation. Um, as I say, nearly every other week, we have once again crested well past the first hour, uh, nearly to a second hour, and we certainly have set once again another record for the longest podcast uh, and, and live show that, that we have ever done. But, uh, but, but no, thank you so much uh, for this, Rob, um, and thank you everyone for listening. I will remember uh, two weeks in a row, guys, that Please feel free to like the podcast, subscribe to the podcast, uh, rate us five stars on Audible, iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all of those places you can rate us and check us out on manufacturinghub.live where you can see all of the podcasts as they come out on Thursday, all the live shows as they come out on Wednesdays and check the entire backlog um, and and make sure to sign up for the newsletter to catch everything going forward. Uh, But no, how about we say until next week, we'll see everyone soon. And we will drop Rob's podcast live show that he does at least every week talking about IoT uh, somewhere in the description. So if you want more Rob, you will not, uh, you will not struggle to find more Rob uh, on the internet. Thank you, Rob. Really appreciate it. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Thanks so much for having me and this marathon Joe Rogan style long podcast. I love it. This is great.